Hello, everyone, and welcome to a TA Network hosted webinar, Effectively Integrating CANS into Wraparound. So um, if you were on a minute or two ago, you heard us announce that we had, this is our largest uh, attended webinar, and we're super excited. We have people who are still pouring in, but, uh, if, you know, to make sure we can get through all the content, uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to actually ask my um, colleagues who are joining me today to go ahead and introduce themselves. Actually, before I do that, let me remind the new people that have just joined us that down at the bottom of your screen, towards the right, three icons in, you should see a chat box or a chat circle. And so we'd ask you to click on that, make sure it's working for you. Um, that will be how you can communicate with us as presenters um, or with Tiara as the host. If you have any um, issues, she'll be in the chat talking with uh, all of you. And um, as I said, w I, we have really a thousand people that have registered for this webinar. So we'll see how many people get on and join us, but that is a large number. So we'll be leaving your lines muted throughout the whole presentation. So chat away, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so let's start by introducing the presenters and let me start with my colleague, Kim Estep. If you could just uh, introduce yourself quickly, Kim. Okay, John, can you introduce yourself? And Eric. Hello. Good morning to those of you here on the West Coast with me in Seattle. Uh, this is Eric Bruns, University of Washington, as well as the National Wraparound Initiative and National Wraparound Implementation Center. Thanks, Eric. And this is Michelle Zabel. I'm the director of the National Technical Assistance Network, as well as an advisor to the National Wraparound Implementation Academy. And as John and I were reminiscing a little bit ago, I actually, 18 years ago, sat with him in New Jersey and um, was part of a collaboration to develop the CANS Comprehensive. So I am, like probably many of you in the country, really excited to have the opportunity to have this conversation. It's been a long time coming and we know, particularly based on the responses we got through registration, that this is an important topic for everyone. So um, as a reminder of why we're even here, we, are, um, we know that wraparound is really the most common uh, practice for care coordination in the country. And we know that at this point in time, CANS is the most widely used assessment tool in the public systems and growing by the day. So we wanted to make sure that we had the capacity to talk for those folks who are implementing CANS and implementing wraparound about, talk honestly about some of the nuances that I know we struggle with in implementation. And so we're really happy to be convening this conversation and we've been spending a good amount of time together working through the nuances. So today's presentation will give us an opportunity to not only um, present to you what, um, what we've come up with in terms of guidance, but hear back from people as well about the actual um, uh, ways that you're implementing and so on. So as part of any good webinar should have, we've got a couple polling questions that we wanted to um, bring up and, and get some of your thoughts about. Um, and uh, in all transparency, we have researchers on the um, line, and so we'll be, they'll be actually gathering this information so that um, we can uh, start to really think about how to, what next steps should really be happening. So um, if you guys could get yourself ready, the actual um, first polling question is going to show up to the right of your screen. And the question that we'd like to ask you is which response best matches the mechanism that you use best matches your current implementation of CANS or wraparound. And so if you could just quickly um, respond to that, we'd really appreciate it. And we'll be keeping this information, disseminating it um, 
when we disseminate this taped webinar to people as well. Okay. So we're giving you about 15 seconds to finish up the actual polling question. Um, so I'm going to move on to the uh, second question, and that is for those of you who use wraparound, do you follow high fidelity, process carefully, generally work to use high fidelity wraparound processes, use the general philosophy of wraparound but not necessarily use all the components of high fidelity wraparound or some other approach? And if you could um, respond to that in the chat, we'd very much appreciate it. And I'm gonna give you a few seconds to get that done. Just gonna give you another few seconds and then we're gonna go ahead and close the poll up. So at this point, what uh, the data show are that the um, A, which is follow high fidelity wraparound process carefully. So of all the folks on the phone, over half of you are um, stating that you follow high fidelity wraparound carefully. And our final polling question as we start, and again, I really appreciate you guys doing this with us so we have a sense of who's on the phone and how you use the models. The third polling question is, how would you describe your state or system of care's current status of figuring out how CANs and wraparound can work together? And your choices are we have only one or neither, so it's not currently an issue. It's been an easy and straightforward process from the beginning. It was challenging, but we have figured it out. And we're currently trying to make it work, but it remains difficult. It, or finally, it's been a major challenge and we continue to struggle. Folks could weigh in on that question, that would be really great. And I see some people adding context to that. We appreciate that very much. We'll be able to pull all of this information. Um, if anyone has joined us, because we do have people still kind of pouring in, uh, we have about half of the folks saying we're currently trying to make it work, but it remains difficult. So it is. Part of, the, part of the reason, Eric, that we actually um, work together on this initiative to try and get this information out to the field. The question that we wanted to ask people that we're really interested in is just a few words in the chat box, if people wouldn't mind, of um, the primary challenges you feel you have in implementing wraparound and can. So for those of you who are not implementing this together at this point in time, you may not have um, a response to this, but, but in the um, previous polls, what we've seen is a large number of people who are really uh, working to implement both. And we would just like a word or two for you to enter right into the chat box of um, the primary challenge uh, that you're facing. And we'll use that to ultimately um, put it into a word cloud for you, and it'll come back out on the NWI website as well as with the dissemination of this taped webinar when we send that out as well. So I'll give you a minute to just type in a few of the most, uh, of the words that most clearly um, describe the um, primary challenges you're facing in implementing wraparound and CANs. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all. And if you want to keep with your um, word submissions, we'll take everything that is submitted throughout this entire um, presentation and, and hopefully clean it all up, put it in a word cloud and get it out for people so that you can see. This data will also be really informative for this group as we take next steps together to really try and assist the field. So I said this a little bit in the beginning when I introduced myself, but as someone who is deeply invested in the TA Network's work, in the work of the CANs across the country and in NWIC, um, you know, there is through the leadership on this um, webinar, a real understanding of some of the nuances that need to be explained and organized so that um, 
the implementation can be done really successfully. And we always want to be on the side of helping implementation be successful on behalf of kids and families. So it was not a hard decision for us to actually decide to come together and um, work through the nuances that are organized in the paper that's basically being presented today, effectively integrating the CANS into the wraparound process. You know, as you know, there are, there are truly some small um, kind of philosophy differences that come from the development of the CANS in wraparound, but at the end of the day, if you were to sit in a room and talk with the leadership of all those efforts, you would know there's absolutely no overarching um, differences that, that truly the world views and the goals of what we want to help the system be capable of doing on behalf of kids and families um, are absolutely convergent and they absolutely align. And so um, we took the time in February a year ago to come together for a couple days and really be honest and transparent about um, what we're hearing from the field as struggles and then try and create solutions for those troubles, nuances, and ultimately then this guidance document which is resulting in this webinar. So that's, that's why we're here today. And, um, you know, as uh, leaders in this area, I think we all fully recognize as well that there's a lot that we still need to hear from communities that are implementing. And so this is the beginning of an improved conversation around doing this, um, you know, because we want to make sure that it's able to um, move forward and that, that we really are moving the field forward. So um, we've had a couple difficulties as we started this, but I'm going to hope that John's able to catch this and um, take the next slide and give us some of the operational frictions as we've been able to define it. So, John, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thanks, Michelle. So, if I can have the next slide, that would be perfect. And we can go from there. All right. So, in our meetings, you know, we talked about it, and I think, you know, there's always, I, it's interesting because with the CANs, we're always trying to integrate with everything. And it's actually, I think, a little bit harder with wraparound because, as Michelle said, they actually, the CANs and wraparound come from the same philosophy. So, because they're so actually consistent in their vision, that makes it a little bit more challenging. So, uh, one of the things is that, that's a challenge is, is the consensus piece. I mean, so it's standard in a child family team to write, try and reach an agreement, uh, but maybe you're reaching agreement in a different fashion than you are recording with the CANs and so forth. So that creates some potential for um, attention. There's also, you know, attention between using the language of the family and using the language of the CANs, because the CANs is a common language approach, but it really is intended to allow us to combine stories in aggregate so that we can have systems that care, that says people that are uh, removed from the child family team can also make their decisions based on the best interests of children and families. But when you're actually working with that family, you want to be able to talk in their language so that you understand them. And the other uh, tension sometimes is the CANS is a universal assessment. So what's happening is about, as of this year, about somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of all children in either public behavioral health or child welfare will be touched by the CANS. So it's really designed to go across the system. So we try to integrate with everything, but that becomes a challenge, right, because there's a bunch of different things. And so figuring out how to do that with wraparound, I think, is an important piece given the important role of wraparound in helping kids who have pretty challenging needs stay at home. When we talk about care coordination, um, you know, we also see Kansas truly, um, you know, the numbers that John is talking about in terms of being used across the country are staggering. For wraparound, as we help people um, organize to implement, it is always intended to be reserved for the youth with the most complex behavioral health and mental health needs. And so um, I'm assuming most people on this phone understand truly the core values of being individualized, family-based, youth-driven, team-based. And um, instead of anything being standardized in wraparound, we're always looking for um, individualization and um, the, that the both individualized to the youth, but also to the family. And so we start by, you know, family narrative, we construct a vision, 
we do, we try and create need statements that are regarding underlying needs that have, that really look at the problem, event, or behavior, and then what is the strengths-based vision for that. And then there is this regular interval of timing that not just is determined to be best practice, but a lot of times is put into systems um, actual contracts for their care coordination, and not all of those things fit exactly the same timing as kind of recommendations in terms of CANS assessments. So we definitely see that the alignment is there for uh, with CANS, but the nuances and the details of implementation can, can as we all admit, create some operational frictions. Um, so when we look at the concerns, what we've heard from surveys that we've done for, um, from practitioners and supervisors is we hear people talk about how they worry that the cans, John, um, can create limited creativity and um, leaves the family feeling washed over by the standardized approach or that the concerned is that the standardized assessment process really kind of moves people away from engagement, that that skill set of engaging, truly engaging, of um, organizing a planning process, of individualizing it, that um, it's a high level skill, as we all know, to do something like that. And people can worry about CANs being an, an easy over-reliance for younger care coordination folks or even teams who are struggling to really embrace the model. And on the flip side, John, you, I, I know you know that um, CANS practitioners have their own worries about wraparound, which are? The, uh, the CANS practitioners, uh, one of the tensions is that since it's a common language approach, uh, there's a concern. So uh, just to tell you a story of one of the origins of the CANS, um, was designed in a meeting of the system of care in one of the original wraparound sites actually in Allegheny County. And there was a debate uh, in the design of the cans between parents and practitioners about the use of jargon. And there was two clear camps that there was one camp that said we need to create accessible language for everybody to understand. And there's another camp who said, no, we need to keep clinical jargon in the tool. And the, I think probably the biggest career surprise I've ever had in my life, it's actually the parents who were pushing to make sure we included clinical jargon in the tool. Because what they said was, don't talk to us in one language and then, you know, and then talk about us in a different language. And if you're going to talk about us outside of this team, teach us how you talk about us. So we've always honored the idea of let's have some elements of a common language as a part of the hands because that's how you empower people is with the power of, uh, with the language of power. And so, although we fully respect the family voice and the family's uh, use of ways of understanding their lives, we also think teaching them common language is a useful part of uh, developing an advocacy strategy. Hi everybody, Eric Bruns here from University of Washington. It is not surprising that we have so many folks who in the poll question uh, voice that they're doing both CANS and wraparound. Clearly CANS is uh, now a leading, if not the leading, uh, child and family assessment tool that's being used in systems of care and wraparound, clearly. Uh, wraparound is uh, clearly the, the most, the leading um, care coordination model for kids with complex needs and their families. And so we're seeing this um, situation where, as Michelle was describing, in so many different states and systems of care, we have both of these philosophies and uh, models operating simultaneously. Um, so good to be with you all now. And um, at this point, I think we're uh, moving to um, the next uh, slide. And um, we want to launch a poll. So recognizing, as so many folks have uh, offered up in the chat box, and as Michelle said, we will be making use of these data um, that folks have provided. We've spent a lot of fruitful years at the National Wraparound Initiative tapping into the collective wisdom of the field to learn about things such as the non-negotiables of wraparound practice, critical elements of the organizational and system context, and so forth. So today, thank you so much for providing 
your input about um, the kinds of frictions that you've found and challenges. Um, right now we want to ask about whether or not a very specific kind of piece of overcoming those challenges is something that you've experienced. So for those of you who have both cans and wrap around in your system or your state, um, have you received training aimed at supporting you to integrate the two in your practice? Let us know whether or not your, the best answer is um, for those of you doing both cans and wrap around, which is the vast majority of you all, that yes, and this has been very helpful in resolving the issues, yes, but we still struggle. C would be we plan to, do, to have training, but have not yet, or D, that you have not yet had that kind of um, support to your workforce. So let's hear what people are finding about the degree to which they've gotten that kind of formal support to coordinating the two. Okay, thanks for pe to people for hanging with us. Let's see what the results are. It's a pretty simple question. So what we see is 120 out of 330 people that have responded. The answer is no. And uh, the next highest answer is yes, but we struggle. 95 out of 330. Okay, so we have a lot of work to do, John, between Chapin Hall um, and National Wraparound Implementation Center. This, is, this webinar is kind of our first foray, as well as the joint statement that hopefully folks have accessed in trying to provide kind of broad-based guidance, but certainly Chapin Hall and National Wraparound Implementation Center are uh, finding ways to try to help folks to do this, but we have obviously a lot more work to do. The next poll, and this is the last one, and we're going to get into walking through the joint statement and guidance document, is we're now really interested in what currently best describes your integration of cans and wraparounds. So we're now going to walk you through the guidance document that we've produced and that hopefully have, people have access to. Um, but currently, what would best describe the way that you integrate the two if you have both cans and wraparounds? So um, is cans completed only to determine access to wraparound as a um, care coordination model, intensive care coordination model for kids with complex needs? Is it completed outside ch child and family team meetings, but yet is discussed within child and family team meetings, so a little bit more integration into practice? Is it both completed and discussed within child and family team meetings? Um, or D, um, is completing CANS regularly an expectation, but it's not um, integrated into wraparound practice or used actively? And then E, uh, is there something that better describes the way in which you have tried to coordinate both cans and wraparound? Please click the option of E. Um, so we'll be interested to see what folks who are on the webinars um, best take is on what currently is occurring in their um, system or state. Again, we're going to be taking as much away from this as anyone who's attending so that uh, as we uh, make use of the responses to your polls and to your open-ended comments. All right, so maybe we'll take a look at the results so we can kind of keep moving here. So there's a basic, a little bit of a close uh, tie between Kansas completed outside and Kansas completed regularly, so B and D. And I'm looking for the finishing statements. But they're basically tied, 96 and 99 out of the 205 people that oh, okay. have, uh, so, wow, those, yeah. are, those are the vast majority of the responses. All right, so, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of the do's and don'ts uh, about this. And I think that what, you, what people have said is something we've observed in, in the field. Um, but uh, but let's, let's, um, let's move on now to what we're really trying to accomplish in our shared work between uh, NWI and Chapin Hall. Uh, it, which is to overcome these uh, frictions. So maybe uh, John uh, started off from the CANS and PCOM side, and then we'll talk a little bit about ways that we see that we can overcome these frictions on, from the wraparound side. Yeah, one of our experiences is that one of the most common challenges is people think that CANS is an assessment, that it's some way of gathering information, and it's not. It's the output of the discovery process. And so the idea behind it is that I think the metaphor is more like it's a closet organizer, right? That you're really not actually doing any specific process to generate the information from the cans. You're doing your normal process of discovery. And you should actually, if you do due diligence and you have conversations with families and with other people in the team, 
you should have in that process identified the common themes in, in that family story and you should be able to actually complete the cans and make sure that uh, the family's in agreement that this is how you're doing it. So it's, it's not designed to be an assessment. So it's not designed to, uh, to compete with your uh, culture and discovery processes. It's, in, it's designed to after you've done your standard of care uh, in terms of how you understand families, how you understand their story, then you complete this as a way of organizing the story and communicating it outside of the child family team. So again, you can inform the, the system about the best interests of the uh, children and families that you're working with. So, I mean, I would say, don't make it about the cans. I mean, the cans is nothing. I mean, the cans is just a way of organizing information. It's about wraparound. It's about doing due diligence, doing a good job of understanding the story. And the can should reveal itself if you do a good job. And so if you think about it that way, then I think that reduces a significant amount of operational friction because it's really just kind of a, another way of documenting the story. I mean, you can have the narrative, but the problem is it's really hard to read a narrative and you can't really combine narratives to understand the impact we have on the lives of, of children and families. You do have to have a more organized uh, strategy if you want to combine stories. And so, or if you want to rapidly communicate stories, you know, um, judges might not read the uh, whole narrative, but they might actually be perfectly willing to understand what the Kansas is telling them, et cetera. So as you, as you move outside of the child family team, it's just a communication strategy. But just don't make it about the CANs, because it's not about the CANs. Thanks, John. And yeah, so the, another one of the issues is, is that since CANs is used for families at all levels of care, uh, youth and families identified as having the most complex needs can and should have a unique and more intensive individualized approach, which is wraparound for convening helpers. So, you know, one of the reasons we were interested in finding out which flavor of wraparound fidelity your state or system was attempting to adhere to is recognizing that wraparound can just be a philosophy of care that is applied to um, uh, care coordination and other models of in-home um, youth and family-driven service that is not necessarily as intensive as uh, wraparound as is implemented by the National Wraparound Implementation Center states and so forth. And it could very well be that the CANS is something that informs um, uh, service processes much more so than when you're doing a full intensive and individualized team-based wraparound process. Next slide. So um, from the wraparound side, ripping on that point, um, when you are doing a full wraparound process, convening a team of individuals that are uh, supporting the youth and family, including natural supports, um, wraparound ideally does not rely solely on ideographic measures. Systems of care that use wraparound for youth with the most complex needs also do require standardized measurements. So just as John was saying that the CANS is uh, a closet organizer and the, that the completion of CANS as a tool is not recommended. Um, we're also recognizing that wraparound, although we do rely primarily on uh, need statements in the family's words that represent one or two priority needs that the team is going to work on together, at the same time, there's plenty of room for standardized assessments. Systems of care that use wraparound also can benefit greatly from standardized measurement that provides a common language for evaluating levels of need, eligibility for services, and outcomes. Um, Wraparound-based systems of care benefit greatly from these standardized assessments in order to inform those who are um, informing and working in the systems of care which types of needs are most common among wraparound enrolled youth, and in fact, youth across all levels of need. Um, we want to be able to have standardized assessments to better be able to monitor uh, outcomes across um, all children and families that are enrolled in services. So, um, and then at a, at a practice level, periodic CANS assessment can be useful as a check against priority needs as identified by a youth, family, and team. So, although um, wraparound does rely on those ideographic or individualized measures, uh, systematic um, and standardized measurement using tools such as the CANs are, uh, benefit the process greatly across both system organizational and practice levels. So recognizing this 
um, common interest that we have in improving systems of care and improving practice for kids and families. Um, clearly, we wanted to develop a consens consensus statement that helped aid the field um, in bringing the philosophies of both TCOM and CANS together as well as wraparound. And uh, Michelle, have you, were you able to tell the story of our, our convening that we had uh, some many months ago? Well, I didn't tell it at the detail that you'll probably want to. So I did recognize that we got together, but I think you should tell a little bit of it. Well, um, recognizing that, uh, you know, John and his uh, trainers and teams, as well as ours at the National Wraparound Implementation Center and NWI, were uh, both in so many different systems of care. And as was reflected by folks on this uh, webinar, there were these struggles. There were these um, challenges in trying to figure out what the best ways to integrate um, the two philosophies and approaches are. We just decided to have a little uh, summit. And so for uh, a full day, um, John, Kim Estep, and Michelle and myself all got together here in our offices at the University of Washington in Seattle. I think John had a wonderful opportunity to also visit his daughter who lives in the area. Um, but we were able to, over the course of about eight hours and, um, you know, I think a few drinks afterwards, uh, think about what would be the points that we would want to communicate to the field about both the recognizing the frictions but also appreciating the common place from which the two philosophies come from and put out there some guidance about um, what cans and wraparound working together effectively could and should look like. And at the very least, making sure that we are not, um, that, that folks are, are not um, conducting that kind of coordinated practice in a way that might uh, degrade the wraparound process or be uh, not true to the CANS and the TCOM philosophy as well. So here's the consensus statement and guidance document that folks should be able to find simply by Googling uh, CANS and wraparound NWI or going to our website at www.nwi.pdx.edu. And what we'll do now is just walk through some of the highlights of this uh, guidance document for folks who've joined. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna talk about are some of the pieces of guidance from the engagement phase. And so a quick poll uh, that will ask folks a little bit about um, what they currently do um, that is relevant to uh, engagement of children and families um, in wraparound. You wanna go ahead and launch that, Tiara, there we go. So for those of you who do have both cans and wraparound, we're kinda of curious about how you sequence your work. Which of these steps typically comes first? Use the cans to interview the family, explain wraparound to the family, engage the family to understand their story, engage referral sources and potential team members to understand their perspective of the situation. Option E is actually should be uh, both C and D, not three and four, but the third and fourth options, um, or none of the above. What would you say best says uh, what you do uh, first in wraparound when you also have CANS as a uh, piece of your system of care. <clears throat> People who are attending this webinar as well as doing it need to recognize and remember that uh, unconditional care and persistence are, are principles of wraparound and that's what we're trying to do here is just persevere and persist despite some of these obstacles. So people are still answering, Eric, so just give it a second or two more. Mm -hmm. So pretty consistently, um, well, there's two. It's like a horse race, if you could see it. <laughs> so um, people are saying, um, explain wraparound to the family is the is the winner, but not by much. The mm -hmm. one that comes in a very close second is both three and four, which is engage the family to understand their story and engage referral sources and potential team members to understand their perspective of the situation. Close. Okay, cool. Um, let, why don't we, in the interest of time, um, well, why don't we well, go ahead and launch one more poll and we'll see what folks say. So you'll see that there's no uh, perfect 
perfectly right way to do things, but we're going to tell you a few do's and don'ts about um, using the cans in the engagement phase or wraparound. So go ahead and launch one more poll, and we'll see what the field currently says. Um, so uh, similar question, for those who have both cans and wraparound, what best describes what happens? Um, hearing the family story and completing the cans are completed separately during different interactions with the family. The cans is completed at the same time as the family story is heard for the first time or the CANS is completed as a summary of the family story and shared back to ensure accuracy and agreement. Now, of course, while you're completing that, you may have heard some clues as to what uh, the um, developer of the CANS might say is kind of the ideal way to use the CANS. But be honest, tell us what you think happens in your system of care or state currently. And then we'll talk a little bit about the engagement phase. While we're waiting for those answers to come through, we can talk about, you know, again, in true system of care and, and wraparound fashion. So um, 114 out of 253 respondents have said hearing the family story and completing the cans are completed separately during different interactions with the family. And then um, the runner-up is the cans is completed as a summary of the family story and is shared back to ensure accuracy and agreement. Very so interesting. So, John, any in, thoughts? Think, yeah. What, yeah. What do you there think we about have that? the operational friction, right? I mean, that's a redundant process for families, and that's not really family friendly, actually. So, I would suggest for those of you who, who have operations like that, there's an opportunity to, uh, to make things smoother for families and not force them to have two separate interactions one that's around wraparound and one that's around camp, if you can possibly avoid it. Right, so I think that our challenge as, uh, as leaders in the field and trainers on um, both CANS as a uh, assessment process and consensus building process as well as a wraparound is, is that um, re recognize that both wraparound and the TCOM process of completing the CANS emphasize approaching the engagement phase from the perspective of listening to the family story. And uh, if you go ahead to the next uh, slide, um, yep, there's a nice little animation there. Um, Go ahead to the next slide there. Um, certainly information from multiple um, perspectives should be considered and infused into the family story for both wraparound planning and CANS scoring. Um, so John, I think, has now emphasized this a couple of different uh, times, which I think is, is really important. So when we're talking about uh, the do's and don'ts about trying to coordinate CANS, the use of the CANS into the wraparound process, Let's look at the do's first. We really do encourage use of standardized assessment measures such as the CANS to assess eligibility for intensive services. So we, we, you know, we, we really believe that at a system level we need standardized assessments to ensure that families are fit to the right sized help and that systems of care ideally have uh, an array of different intensities of options for coordination of care as well as provision of evidence-based treatments. Wraparound being reserved for youth with the highest levels of needs, and um, as as John talks about quite a bit out there in the field, um, you know, CANS is a way to really ask um, based on a, a good, deep understanding of the the family's strengths and needs. What what is it, what are the actionable needs and the level of actionable needs across all of these different domains that uh, children and families have? Um, so we really do emphasize the need for using standardized assessments and systems of care. Um, certainly, we encourage describing the CANS and how it will be used before and during wraparound so that it's clear for the, for the family and the team. Um, and you'll be hearing more tips as we finish up the webinar here. Consider using a brief CAN screener for initial eligibility purposes. Um, a lot of uh, actors in the systems of care are not going to have an, an in-depth understanding of the family strengths and needs, but yet you want to get families quickly to the right size help. So a lot of states out there do use brief can screeners and then use the full cans um, as uh, we engage families more fully in, in um, models such as wraparound. Um, as John has said several times, complete a full baseline cans using information from the family's story. Um, and as you'll see in the don'ts, the big don't is to not be using the CANS as many people assume standardized assessment tools are, where you are reading from this uh, list of many items 
Um, it is not an engaging way to do that work. Complete the CANs within 30 days of referral to wraparound. Again, sometimes after a brief CAN screener has, uh, in combination with other information, has gotten the families to the right level of care. And ensure that actionable needs are considered for initial crisis and safety plans. So whether it's from the screener or from the assessment, the CANs can be useful right from the beginning of the wraparound process. Uh, wraparound really does encourage that we are uh, assessing for uh, safety and need for rest among parents, caregivers, youth, and the CANs can um, help fit families or help meet families' needs as quickly as uh, they need it uh, before the formal wraparound process begins. So um, certainly do not complete the CANs by administering it item by item. Um, do not mandate full completion of the CANs before the family has been fully engaged. That is uh, not the intent of the CANs um, and certainly can um, can hinder engagement of any family to, to have those kinds of uh, roadblocks that might be in the, in the way. Um, don't review results of the CANs before the family has been fully informed about and engaged in the wraparound process. And please do not pre-populate a plan of care with CANs items at any point in the wraparound process. We have heard instances or examples of CANs drives the plans. We think CANs can inform the plan in different ways and certainly inform our understanding of how systems of care or how effective systems of care are and how effective teams are for individual kids. But when you start pre-populating plans of care with CANS items or any kinds of items without that full engagement of the family and a full in-depth understanding of what they, in their own words, would identify as their priority needs, then we know that we're we are experiencing some problems. Anything to add with it to that, John? No, just the full endorsement of, of that, I think the, uh... The challenge is there are some places that say, you know, if you have a two or a three on the can, you got to do something. But that's naive. I mean, that's not really accurate because you have to take it a bit further. And I think, you know, you can use the cans to help you think about how you might develop a, a, a need statement and wrap around you know, how many, what you might think is the driving mm -hmm. issue that you need to address. But you shouldn't be, like you said, pre-populating. Makes no sense. All right. So moving to the second phase of wraparound, the planning phase, one thing we're going to focus on in this uh, phase, and this is uh, highlighted in the guidance document, that similar terminologies across wraparound and the TCOM process or the CANs can create confusion. Um, go on to the next slide. I think we're going to skip the last couple polls so we can get to Q&A. Um, so one thing we got to do is come to terms with uh, terminology. Um, so these kinds of when you do have CANs and wraparound coexisting in the same system, you've got this, this challenge with uh, the same words, um, you know, on the surface being used for each. So under, but we have to recognize that, um, that the terminology is different for each. So starting with wraparound, we, we know that an underlying need is a longstanding underlying condition that's led to the problematic events or behaviors and around which all planning and strategizing are focused. These are going to be in the family's words. There's only going to be one or two of them that are the focus of the intensive work at a time of a wraparound team. Um, and as we'll hear in a sec, that's very different from needs in, in the CANS assessment. Um, with respect to uh, needs statements, again, these are not deficits, but instead phrases that promote creativity and brainstorming of strategies. So the example here is Matthew needs to know people can be permanent parts of his life. Now, these do not uh, the fact that they are different from CAN's uh, terminology doesn't mean they can't coexist. Um, but go ahead and describe a little bit about these two terms in CAN's and TCOM, John. Yeah, I'd basically make the point that in wraparound, uh, the word is typically a verb, and in CAN's land, it's typically a noun. And so that changes how you use it, that changes what it means um, a little bit, but it's not necessarily competing. So, you know, if you have a need, then you're going to need to do something ultimately. And so they, they can work together, but the, the overlap of the language is can be challenging because it's it's different. One's a verb and the other a noun. So. All right. So go ahead to the, the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit about um, strengths. Um, so in wraparound, functional strengths are defined as the family's capacity to cope with difficult situations. And we use these as the basis for planning. 
uh, you know, we can't get into a full wraparound training on this webinar, but um, those who attend wrap, wraparound trainings from NWIC and the NWI folks um, learn all about ways to create uh, statements about strengths and finding those functional strengths that can be the basis for planning. Um, but the CANS is, is not a, a full uh, wraparound process, so uh, strengths in CANS are different, right, John? So, yeah, I mean, so this the CANS, again, goes into a common language framework, which then limits that in some ways creativity, right, because there's only so many things you can put into categories, and you have to, if you're going to have a common language framework, you do have to have those groupings. Mm -hmm. And so typically most things fit in a grouping, but the, not necessarily everything. And the other thing about CAN strengths is that we really are focused on not just using strengths, but building strengths. And so there's a bit of a language issues around this in terms of how do you help people either utilize strengths or how do you build strengths. And there's a little bit of language strengths that are important to understand, but they're not necessarily competing at all. So for the functional strength and a CAN strength typically are overlapping. But the functional strength in the wraparound is a far broader concept. It includes things that might not be listed under the categories in the can. Right. If you go to the next slide, we'll just summarize some of the do's and don'ts during the planning phase. But I mean, you know, riffing on what John is saying, you know, the big thing here is is that a standardized assessment is going to require grouping of systematically defined uh, and consistent uh, phenomena like strengths items. In wraparound, strengths are going to be unique to every family and youth. And both of those things have a role in planning and in evaluating progress, even though uh, they have the same, uh, the same word at their base, strength, they're going to be used in different ways. So in the planning phase, the things we do want to do is to use the CANs to help brainstorm strategies for the plan of care, both the needs items and the uh, strengths that uh, pop up. Uh, these are things that the team can use as raw materials for the plan of care. What do we see as things that are our needs, have we missed anything? Um, what are the things that we've seen as strengths? Do we have them all really adequately appreciated on this team? And, and the CANS can be something that can help supplement the full wraparound process. Um, consider using CANS items as options for monitoring progress. So right at the beginning, what are, these, what are the CANS items that are popping up? We are going to have these uh, unique priority underlying needs that we're working on, but it could be that these CANS items uh, are going to be one way that we, we know whether or not we're making progress, because it is a standardized approach. Um, and ensure baseline CANS data is compiled across all wraparound youth and families to help inform the system. That's a huge piece of why the CANS is so uh, popular and why standardized assessment is so critical. What we don't want to happen is to mistake CANS actionable needs for underlying needs in wraparound. Um, or to attempt to develop strategies for more than a small number. So one thing we've seen is, is that the mean number, we did a study where we compiled CANS data from about 12 different systems of care and states using wraparound. And we found that the average number of actionable needs at baseline in wraparound systems of care for youth and families was 12 and a half. You cannot, pri you cannot base your planning process on 12 and a half priority needs. It will overwhelm the family and the team. We use, uh, but nonetheless, that information can be useful as you uh, do your work in, in, in wraparound, but we are going to base our planning around those priority underlying needs, those holes in the heart that lead us to, to do things we shouldn't and not do things we should. So uh, moving on, I know we, we <laughs> started I, uh, late. Oh, yeah, go right ahead, I, John. Split yeah. second on that because I think there's a couple things that are really important. I completely agree with what you just presented, of course. Uh, one of the things you can think about that's actually very congruent with CANS and TCOM is that monitoring progress would include doing celebrations. And you can mm -hmm. use a CANS in a celebration, and celebrations are really, really important. Uh, it's scientific, it's not scientific. You know, scientific is following the scientific method, scientific is looking like you're following the scientific method, but sometimes it's very, very powerful to help families see in some of the, in this sort of pseudo objective way, look at the progress they've made, look what they need to continue to work on in this kind of standard assessment strategy. And so you can actually embed the CANs change over time as a part of your celebrations about the great things that families have accomplished working together with you. So, yeah, absolutely. and also I agree with you 100%. You can't do 12 things. If you can do two or three things well, that's good. And it's overwhelming. Yep. So that kind of one for uh, approach with if you have an actual need, you got to do something about it. Just is naive. 
Yeah. And we have seen systems that literally have written into yeah. statute or regulations. Right, for right, every right. for every actionable need, there needs to be a set of strategies. That's a a really good yeah. way to quickly break a wraparound process. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, so that's one All of those right, things. That if people yeah. know about those, they should tell us about that because we will talk to the powers that be to get that fixed. So that's just well, a that misunderstanding. Is, of the All right. Let that be part of the record. Okay, let's skip the polls. Um, and we're seeing some interesting comments to the <laughs> responses to that comment. I can't wait to uh, really dig into all these comments. Please feel free to keep putting your, your observations into the chat box. We're going to have a great record of this phenomenon. Um, so our third phase of wraparound, the implementation phase. Um, important to note, and maybe John should take this. I think you've already said it. The CANs should be done with flexibility and should not be uh, should not require the family to retell their story. I like the idea of the uh, closet organizer. Anything else you want to add to this one, John? No, but I just can't emphasize this enough. So that's really how what this is designed to be. It's a measure of the story. It's not how you get the story. It's simply a measure of the story. Once you have the story, you don't have to ask a question to get the answer. Well, you can't. If you already have the answer, you've got the answer. So, you, But you do want to circle back and make sure you're not misrepresenting families with their kids. Well, that's really important because this process is transparent. You don't want to be communicating about people in a way that they don't know you're communicating about them. So. All right, so um, again, all of this is uh, noted in, in even greater detail in the guidance document, but we recognize CANS required assessments may not coincide at all per perfectly with team meetings, that CANS is typically administered every three to six months. That data is really critical for systems of care to have, as well as for monitoring progress for individual kids and for all your kids. Uh, but it's not going to align with your team meetings, typically. Next phase, next uh, slide. Um, so some things to consider in, the, in your do's and don'ts. Um, have newly identified actionable CANS items uh, popped up and demand attention? So while you're doing the implementation phase of wraparound and having these periodic team meetings, if you have an independent CANS assessment, what do those data say? Is there something that because you're working really hard on one or two priority needs that uh, something else has, has emerged that maybe is not being uh, the focus of planning and maybe should be? Um, so consider whether newly identified actionable CANS items demand attention. Check on progress and satisfaction around strategies and use the CANS as one possible source of data. At each meeting, provide a graphic representation of the progress that you've achieved towards the family's vision and meeting underlying needs. Those are the things that we train in that ideographic or individualized kind of assessment model that we use in wraparound training for, at the National Wraparound Implementation Center is if you're going to measure just a couple things that are, that are consistently put in front of the team every month as it comes together. Where are we at with meeting this need we're working on? If you're going to ask one question, what is it, what's our movement toward achieving the family's vision for a more positive future, zero to ten? What is the, our, our success in getting this need met, zero to ten? But then you've got these CANS data, and those CANS data can be useful as well, but they're probably not going to be as available as frequently as you would want to have with just one or two items you're asking everyone on the team or the family, if that's the way you go, um, such as when you're assessing progress towards needs, uh, towards underlying needs. So you can, you can use both, um, but certainly make sure you're using something to track progress. Um, and as John said, use resolved CANS items as the basis for celebration. What you don't want to do is ask the family to complete the CANS via a new interview or survey at every follow-up assessment point. That's the big piece here. Like John said, you should know what the, what the responses to those items will be without having to ask those questions. And certainly do not spend an entire team meeting completing a CANS together. Again, this is something we actually see happening out there, which would really be a poor use of a wraparound team meeting would be to walk through a CANS assessment. You don't even want to do that with a family, let alone an entire team or team meeting um, that, that should be spent um, really brainstorming the things uh, that you need to do to help that family get their underlying needs met. All right, the last phase, as we know, is the transition phase, and as John said, the CANs can be useful as a way to both track progress as well as to celebrate success. So, so we can get to some questions. In the transition phase, let's just real quickly 
describe how we can, some ways in which the CANs can be useful. So ensure that the strategies that are connected to the remain, remaining CANs actionable items are in place. We're not expecting, in that study that we did, we did not see uh, any evidence that all CANs actionable needs were typically met, even with successful wraparound discharges. There's going to be remaining CANs actionable items across youth, across caregivers, across family domains. Those, that is going to happen. Well, our hope is, is that you're transitioning out of wraparound with really meaningful progress towards meeting those priority underlying needs of the family so that they have a better chance of, of, of living and the child has a, has a much greater chance of living and thriving in their home, school, and community and that the parents feel as though they're adequately supported to do this without that intensive process. But there's still going to be needs. Make sure that there are uh, services and supports in place for those needs and warm handoffs uh, are provided. And part of that warm handoff can be uh, providing an end of wraparound process cans to help uh, providers that might continue to support this family and others understand what some of the needs are that remain. Um, and certainly, as John was saying, celebrate family successes around progress towards their achieving their family's vision, um, strength development, and, and that can partly be um, in examining and admiring and celebrating progress on the cans. But what you don't want to do is use cans, change in cans needs items as the only indicator of readiness for transition. That was one of our um, poll questions that we skipped for, for time, but we have seen some states and systems say that cans or other standardized assessments is uh, when, when those uh, scores reach a certain threshold, discharge is mandated. We don't think the CANs or any other kind of standardized assessment should be the only indicator of readiness for transition out of wraparound. It should be a mix of information, including, uh, first and foremost, the family's preference and their own opinions about their needs and the degree to which the progress has been, adequate progress has been made. <clears throat> and similarly, don't mistake a reduced number of actionable CANs items as, a, as an indicator of transition. The presence of a, this is the flip side, so the presence of just a few actionable CANS items could represent significant strain for the family. So you could go from that average of 12 down to three, but if those three actionable CANS needs um, are still representing an extra, you know, a, a source of strain and stress and possibility of out-of-home placement for the, for the youth or family, uh, for the youth, then um, you probably need to continue to work on those underlying needs and wrap around. So, John, any concluding observations or thoughts before Michelle expertly throws some interesting questions our way? Well, I think you've captured it. I think um, the, the idea is to not intrude on the wraparound process with your uh, recording uh, process, or the cans of the recording process. So, making that seamless because you, you take you get a narrative, but you also take notes of the the cans of the notes. And if you think about it in that fashion, I think it doesn't get in the way. Now, the other thing to remember about the CAN, just to highlight something you said, is the CANS is not intended to be an expert system. The CANS is intended, so in other words, it's not intended to make decisions based on the CANS. The CANS is intended to be a decision support. It's to inform decisions, but not make them. And I think sometimes systems struggle with that distinction, but that's a really important distinction. Thank you so much, John. It's been a real pleasure and thrill to be on this record-breaking webinar with you. Michelle, you know, we've got a lot of people still on the line. Why don't you, we, since we are recording this and maybe some of the information we'll throw out there in response to questions will be the most interesting. What are some things you're seeing there that people are asking? Sure, and let me say this, just answer for people who have asked. The, you will receive these slides and this recording. Um, you will get all this material along with, as a reminder, the document that is the basis of this conversation is both on the TA Networks and the Institute's website, but also um, in WI and was part of what was available when you registered for this. So there's uh, it, certainly if you get lost, just email us here at the TA Network and we'll make sure that you get that um, information. So just before we start, guys, there's some things that people want some clarification around. 
that would, I think, help add to the conversation. So, so we've had a few people ask us uh, just to talk a little bit more about the brief CAN screener, and then we can get to some other questions, but there's some clarifying things people want from um, the presentation. So, so John, can you talk to people about the brief CAN screener? Sure. So uh, yeah. the idea is that we kind of make families tell their stories over and over again at different nodes of the system, which is traumatizing and inefficient. So uh, what the idea of the brief CAN screener is you start the story and you only need to know enough information to be helpful in the decision you didn't need to make. You don't have to form a, a full rela relationship with a family in order to make some decisions in the system. So the idea of the CAN is you only need information that you need to make a decision. So based on what that decision is and the decision point in the process, there are versions of this approach where you just use the relevant uh, common themes that are relevant to the decision you're being made. So it's pretty common that uh, the decision into care is uh, guided, is supported with a briefer uh, process of assessment. It's very hard to build sufficient trust to get a full story. You have to get a good enough story to make a decision. You're making a decision anyway. So why not try and make your decision as fulsome as you can by getting the information that you need. So that's the idea of a, of a screener version of the CAN. So the, the shortest version is uh, four items. Um, the longer versions for screeners are about 25 items. So it depends on exactly the nature of the system and the decisions being made. But the idea is that if you have those items completed, you don't recomplete them at the next phase. You start to build on that story and you just develop the story and you're recording that story. So that's why it's so important to understand that the CAN is not an assessment. It's the output of your discovery process. And so John, I'm just gonna stick with you for a minute just so people are really clear in what your guidance is to them. There's a couple other questions that basically are in the vein of just clarify for people again, is the CANS intended to be completed with the family as an interview or to be completed without the family after hearing their story? What's your best guidance to people about the well, right way to um, complete the CANS? Uh, uh, well, kind of a, a sort of in a neither situation uh, is how I would describe it. You definitely do not want to do it as an interview. You definitely do not. It's not intended to be an interview. It's not designed to be an interview. You don't want to do it as an interview. You don't want to complete it completely independent of the family because you are representing them with this information. So, so I know one of the questions was also circle back. You know, what does that exactly mean? Uh, when I said that earlier, let me use this opportunity to answer both of those questions because what you may do is because what we typically do is you know we listen to the story, we kind of pull things together, and then we think about it, right? And so you can pull this together. You can actually develop the cans after the child family team based on what you've been learning whenever that process is, is sufficient. And then you bring the cans back in to show the family. Just make sure that everybody's on the same page. So, in fact, I would recommend that the standard practice is give them a copy of it so that they have it, so that they know what it's about. And, and there's tip sheets that explain how it works and all that kind of stuff so you can demystify it so it's not something they don't understand but it's something they have and that they can use it outside of the child family team if that's useful to them. So that's how I would think about it. It's sort of a, it's definitely not an interview, but it's not like it's completely independent either. You don't just say, okay, I have the team, I'm gonna fill this out and put it in a database and they'll never know that it was even done. That's just wrong, so, okay. And then John, is there a preference uh, or an, or is, the, is it a preference or an appropriate standard that um, the CANS is completed every 90 days. That's well, the Prey like Foundation, which holds the, that for people. Yeah. Well, the Prey Foundation has a, has a policy on that, which says it should be done whenever it's relevant. So, um, so that's kind of our policy. Uh, certain jurisdictions have standards. I mean, you shouldn't really figure out what you're gonna do until you understand the family story, right? So you should have the CANS should be completable uh, as you start to develop the plan, because once you start intervening, it should be a, based on a good enough understanding of the family story. You'll never have a perfect understanding of the story, and that story will unfold as you build trust, but you still have to start somewhere. So typically, people start in the first phase of, of care. They complete a CANS when you have an expectation that now it's time to make sure we have started to plan. Uh, 
Also, as you say goodbye, for the reasons that Eric described well, uh, you may want to complete, you may want to update your cans to make sure you can celebrate successes and that you can communicate to uh, others in the system what progress has been made and what things still need to be worked on. Uh, and then if you have a standard of checking in on a plan, well, I don't know how you can check in on the plan if you're not checking in on the child and family, right? I mean, so any changes in the plan should be driven by an understanding of the changes in that family story. So if the story has changed that leads you to change the plan, then you might want to update the cans. But it's really, really important for everybody to understand updating the cans is a very simple process because you're just changing what's changed. You're not redoing the cans. You're just updating. You're just updating the story. So if you think about this as a way of monitoring the story, you just change it as the story changes. And that's the standard. So sometimes uh, jurisdictions have a 90-day standard of checking in on the plan. Typically, the more you spend on something, the more frequently people want to spend on oh, want to check in on the plan, right? That's typical, which makes sense, right? Because the bigger the investment, the more frequently you should make sure it's being uh, the limited resources are being spent wisely. That's great, thank you. And then. Um, just so people, I'm just going through the CANS questions, John, so people are really clear. So, cool. you know, we both know CANS has a lot of questions. Um, they're not always the types of uh, conversations that are brought up casually. So the question is about, particularly around trauma and, sem and symptoms, what are some of the suggestions um, that you guys give regarding um, the skills or approaches to bring those conversations up, to have those really difficult conversations. Yeah, I think that's a skill, and I think that's all about timing. And so remember that the, this approach is you're just recording what you know. So it's not uncommon for trauma to reveal itself later in the process, and that's okay, right? So you have this process of, of discovery. You don't know everything initially, but you're still trying to help. I wouldn't push it. I wouldn't be interviewing, you know, have you ever been sexually abused kind of interview? That doesn't make much sense. If you already know about it because they're in child welfare and you know from the caseworker that you have the background of why that they're in child welfare, you already know their trauma history. You don't have to ask it again. You can just record it and say, okay, we know about how this happened, how you got into child welfare. You're just letting them know that you know. That's all. Um, so typically I wouldn't say you'd be interviewing ever for a trauma history. I don't think you'd be doing that in a wraparound process, but you may already know about it or it may be revealed as you get to know and people are comfortable with it. And then to ask the question, Eric, from um, from NWI and NWIC, what, what would your thought be? Well, I mean, this is a challenging you know, whether you're trying to complete a standardized assessment so that you have a good record of what the needs of your and, and challenges facing the families you serve are, or if you are trying to use a family story to um, deepen your understanding of what those underlying needs are, what that history is that brought the family to wrap around. These are all extraordinarily difficult things to do, especially when you have families who may have been traumatized, as John was saying, by previous interactions with the system that have not gone well for them or have not been well executed. So, I mean, the, to go back to the way that Carl Dennis would describe it three decades or more ago when I was a grad student just beginning this work, you know, your job as a wraparound facilitator is to simply um, go to where the family is willing to invite you in their life, their home, you know, their kid's school, a coffee shop, wherever it may be, and open your ears and empty your mind and listen. You know, you'll have that huge folder, I'm sure, for a lot of these families. But when you are going to be engaging with the family as an ally and not as an expert and doing real wraparound, you are opening your mind, opening your ears and emptying your mind and listening. And that's the first step. And, you know, that takes skill. It takes skill not to be speaking and not to be an expert when your job is to try to promote positive outcomes for kids. Um, and I know that sounds simplistic, but it is really amazing how hard it is to do. And we try to train folks to go through a systematic process that gets at that family story using a whole bunch of different kinds of skills. But when it comes to trauma and other uh, very sensitive topics, you know, 
being a being a real ally and being engaging is about um, using those skills, maybe using family and youth partners to help facilitate that process and get it get the story from the family's own words and that's going to be the way you're going to be most likely to be a true ally and truly be able to facilitate a process that brings healing to that family. And just to echo that, the process that Eric so eloquently described, with the, all due respect to Colonel Dennis, that's exactly how you should be thinking about the CANs within a wraparound framework. Thank you, so Board. things will reveal themselves in the time that they reveal themselves, and there's no pressure that you have to force people. Because that doesn't actually work, really, right? You need to build a relationship, and that's how people choose to trust you and choose to tell you their story, right? And so it's not only about that. That's why I said, you know, don't make it about the camps, because it's not about the camps. It's about our families. Thank you both. Let me, let me shift this just slightly. People are asking questions as well, John, about using the CANs from multiple perspectives. And Eric, I'm going to turn this to you next, but using, you know, gathering relevant information about families um, using multiple perspectives, not just the family use that is um, yeah. coming into the wraparound process. That's a great question. I don't think we ever quite got around to this, those slides that, uh, that talk about post-triangulation measurements. So, in the CAN's perspective, that that's what you're trying to do. And, and my understanding of that actually was the origins also was that Carl and, and John Annenberg and so forth talked about as you're trying to reach that shared understanding of what's going on in the life of that child. So we have, you know, a good evidence that um, post-triangulation measurement is the best way to look at wholesome outcomes with families, is that you really need to kind of get those multiple perspectives. So the way we think about it is that you hear a family story, but there's always multiple storytellers, right? So, I mean, I don't know about you, for those of you on the phone that have kids, my children's story of their school was always a little bit different than the school story of my kids, right? And you have to kind of pull those multiple storytellers together into a single story because you really can't help people until you really get a story. You know, what's the story? And so. Those, the, the storytellers might be a medical test, right? You need to know actually what's going on, right? And so there's a bunch of different possible storytellers. And so the concept of post-triangulation measurement, which is the CANS, is you combine these multiple storytellers, you try and reach consensus, you get the endorsement of the family. And so you're really using this as to help, helping the family kind of get their story, right? And how do you get your story? Well, you listen to other people's perspective, right? So that's, that sometimes is a tension if you're so focused on it's only the family's voice, but I'm not sure that's really the intention of the child family team. It's only one person's voice. I think, in fact, the reason why you're convening a team in the first place is to understand the multiple perspectives and try to reach a single perspective. And then yeah, the oversimplified this, oh, yeah, the oversimplified way we describe it in the foundational documents of the NWI is that you need to be skilled as a facilitator in blending perspectives. And yep. that is a serious skill. Um, it, but, you know, again, there are methods for, for doing so that have to do with that full engagement of the family, prepping the, the system partners who may be attending the team meeting before they show up. So you got to take time to do things like that before you bring people together. And, you know, at the same time, even though that's a lot of kind of qualitative open-ended uh, interviewing and discussion uh, and you're blending those perspectives in a narrative fashion, um, the, the use of quantitative data and assessment has a role there. So when you, whether you're using it, uh, CANS data that may differ across informants or just simply asking the young person, his sibling, his mother, and I don't know, a teacher, what their various ideas are on a zero to 10 scale at meeting a need that has to do with that kid's school or their behavior in school, and you get ratings from two to eight, you know, across all of them, it, it really is about making meaning of that. Why might we see these different kinds of scores coming from these different people who are all in the same room at the same time? Um, it takes a lot of skill, though, which is why we have to support our facilitators 
to stick around longer than a year or two so that they can get really fluent at this stuff, have a career ladder, pay them adequately, and train them, and train them by doing really intensive work of showing them how this stuff can work, having them practice it in a simulacrum kind of environment like a training room, observe them doing it and giving them feedback, um, because it's it's really tough work. It is tough I'm work. I'm going to put comment on, on uh, somebody's uh, post. They said they're using the uh, ACEs as an initial assessment. Um, that's really bad practice. You know, it's a, I think the ACEs is well-intentioned, but a bad idea. Because you're forcing people to reveal their trauma and assess the I welcome to our help. Here, fill out this thing about all the horrible things that have happened in your life. It's just a bad idea. Thank you both. So, um, yeah. So, um, so we are over time at this point. Surprisingly, we have well over 500 people that are stuck with us. We have a number of questions. We will absolutely take all the questions throughout the um, chat box and do a Q&A sheet for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are really tangible, like where do I get this? How do I find it? What do I do next? And some are far more nuanced. And so there's probably some follow-up that we'll be doing virtually and offering virtually. Um, uh, one of the things that came to mind as I read some of these questions that is that doing some um, kind of further dialogues, guys, and maybe even taping those conversations for people so that they could hear them would probably be really beneficial as people are trying to figure this stuff out. There was a few questions about managed care and um, you know, we're doing all of this work in different financing environments and regulatory and policy environments. All of these are really relevant and important questions for success, which means improved outcomes for kids and families. So um, I'm going to wrap us up. Uh, the PowerPoint, a Q&A document, and the document, and then some further follow-up um, as we dig into what some of these questions are and how we can better help the field in having this conversation. So I thank you, Eric. I thank you, John. I know Kim's been on listening. We appreciate all of you sticking through the messiness of this one, and um, we'll be in touch. So take care, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.